Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Officers hit by a suspect when he throws his SUV into reverse. A lieutenant from the department will talk us through the explosive body cam video. But first, the closing arguments in the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse just wrapped up about an hour ago. His fate now in the hands of the jury. Rittenhouse, now 18, accused of shooting three people too fatally in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after Black Lives Matter protests. Rittenhouse was armed with an AR-15, killed Joseph Rosenbaum outside a parking lot, and then, and this is a separate crime scene, just down the street, shot Anthony Huber and then Gage Grosskreutis, who would survive. Now, Rittenhouse is arguing it was self-defense that they attacked him. Rittenhouse faces five charges, including intentional homicide, punishable by up to life in prison if found guilty. Now, there were some lesser included. We'll talk about that. But there were two different realities in court today about what happened on the night of August 25th, 2020, and why. Let's start with the prosecution. The defendant, by their logic, he gets to run around with a gun all night. But, oh, we're not supposed to take him as a threat. He gets to point the gun at everyone. But, oh, we're not supposed to take him as a threat. No, it doesn't work that way. The same set of rules apply to the defendant as everybody else. There's no exception in the law for Kyle Rittenhouse. There's no exception that says, if anyone else has a gun, you're a danger, except for Kyle Rittenhouse. There's no exception in the law that says, if you point your gun at people, oh, that makes you a threat and I can kill you, except for Kyle Rittenhouse. I can do it all night long. The same rules apply to him as everyone else. So when you consider what's reasonable in this case, consider whether or not it's reasonable for a criminal to be able to shoot himself out of a crime scene. When a bank robber robs a bank and runs away and the crowd comes after him, can he just shoot anybody and claim self-defense? If someone comes up to that person and tries to stop them, tries to disarm them, like Anthony Huber did, do they forfeit their life? Did Anthony Huber forfeit his life? by trying to be a hero and stop an active shooter and protect others. Is that justified? Can the defendant just kill him? You are here to decide whether or not his actions are legally justified, not to buy pathetic excuses that might be given to you. As a teacher, when a student says to you, the dog ate my homework, that's an excuse. It doesn't get you out of the homework assignment. If you panic, in a situation that is not reasonable, that is an excuse. It is not a legal justification. If you're 17, if you don't have training or experience, if you put yourself in a situation where you're in over your head, if you're scared, those are excuses. Those are not legal justifications to kill. They do not erase your personal responsibility for your own actions. Put yourself in the defendant's position. Would you have done the same thing? Would a reasonable person have done the same thing? Would you have engaged in the reckless conduct that led to this course of events? Would you have gone out after curfew with an AR-15 looking for trouble? Would you have aimed at other people? Would you have tried to use the gun to protect an empty car lot? No reasonable person would have done these things. Now, the graphics that you saw there were made by the prosecution and were played for the jury during the closing arguments. Now, the defense painting a very different picture that Rittenhouse was basically in a fight for his life. Kyle shot Joseph Rosenbaum to stop a threat to his person. And I'm glad he shot him because if Joseph Rosenbaum had got that gun, I don't for a minute believe he wouldn't have used it against somebody else. He was irrational and crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a political case. We can take politics out of it as in Democrat and Republican, but the district attorney's office is marching forward with this case because they need somebody to be responsible. They need somebody to put and say, we did it. He's the person who brought terror to Kenosha. Kyle Rittenhouse is not that individual. The rioters, the demonstrators who turned into rioters, those are the individuals who bring us forth. There was no threatening behavior that started this. Mr. Rosenbaum was hell-bent on causing trouble that night. He did what he did, and he started this. There are tragical, tragic 
parts of it, but Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior was protected under the law of the state of Wisconsin, the law of self-defense. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a tough choice, but the evidence only leads to one conclusion. That is that Kyle Rittenhouse's conduct on August 25th was privileged based upon the actions of Mr. Rosenbaum and others. There are no winners in this case, but putting Kyle Rittenhouse down for something he was privileged to do will serve no legitimate purpose. Joining us now, two Wisconsin attorneys, criminal defense attorney Julius Kim and former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Janine Geske, who now teaches at Marquette University. Thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. Before we go to both of you, let me just give you some of my thoughts on the closing arguments. I thought, you know, and, and summarizing it in the way we just did doesn't necessarily do it justice because we've sort of put together some of the highlights there. I think the prosecution did better than I expected um, in the fact that they really focused on those four shots again and again, fired into Joseph Rosenbaum, basically suggesting that it wasn't reasonable. I thought the defense didn't focus enough on the legal standard here. That, that again, I'd be hitting it again and again and again, that the prosecution effectively has to disprove self-defense. I would have been repeating it after again and again. But look, with all that said, yes, this was a better day for the prosecutors than we've had thus far. But my take on this is it remains a serious uphill battle for the prosecution. All right, Julius Kim, your first thoughts on this before we're going to dig deep on this. We're going to talk law. We're going to play sound bites, et cetera. But Julius, first, let me get your thoughts. Well, first of all, Dan, it's great to be with you and an honor to be with Justice Geske as well. Uh, I agree with you. Today was a pretty good uh, day for the state. I mean, up until this point, I think that all of us who have been watching this trial thought that the momentum of the case was going with the defense. And suddenly, the state comes out with this really good, cohesive closing argument that really strung together the facts of the case into a theory that we can all follow. They talked about provocation. They talked about play-by-play, -play, exactly what they believe Kyle Rittenhouse did or could have done, which took away his self-defense privilege. And so I thought they did a really effective job of bringing out their theory finally and also incorporating video evidence throughout their uh, closing argument to really hit home the points that they were making. Today was the day that we were all kind of waiting for because up until today, all these facts were just kind of thrown up against the wall and we didn't really understand or see what the state was talking about, but they brought it home today. And, and Justice Geske, this is one of those cases where the law really matters, meaning there are a lot of cases where it's about emotion and um, you know you try and get the jury riled up, et cetera, and this is one of those, but, but the law here really makes a difference. And I think that however the jurors deliberate this case, they're gonna focus on the law. What did you make of how the parties did on that question of summarizing, simplifying what was a really complicated jury instruction from the judge? Well, first of all, I agree with Attorney Kim, for whom I have a lot of respect, that the prosecution really hit a home run compared to what had been happening during the trial. And I thought they did a really good job of trying to address the judge's instructions and have the jury look at that issue of whether they've been able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that, that um, Rittenhouse wasn't acting reasonably. I thought the defense, as you indicated, was weak today. They didn't argue that beyond a reasonable doubt, the burden the, the government has, and that's really the strength that they've got in this case, is that the state has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And I thought that didn't come across as strongly as it, it could have. But it, it's, it's all an interpretation of those laws and how they interact. There really is not that much dispute about the facts. There's some, but the jury has to wrestle with that law and figure out what's reasonable, what's reasonable self-defense, what happens when you introduce a gun into a situation? And um, I, I thought that the, the state did the best on the closing argument, trying to pull it together for the jury. Let, let me just remind people, the reason we're focusing on this legal standard, let me just sort of bring it to you in, in layperson's language. If you think on the one hand, on the other hand, well, they got a pretty good argument. Well, they, they've got a pretty good response. That's a win for the defense. The defense wins the case. If the jurors are uncertain, if they walk away saying, you know, it was sort of close, I, I kind of sided 
with the prosecution's th not enough not enough he gets acquitted that's why we're talking about this as so important in this case another big issue and i want to play this from the arguments today is a question of provocation meaning what happens if kyle rittenhouse provoked the incident and there's been a lot of misinformation out there about this as a legal matter and practical matter first let me play you some of this this is number three this is the prosecutor explaining why he believes that Rittenhouse provoked the incident. Under Wisconsin law, you're not allowed to run around and point your gun at people. This is the provocation. This is what starts this incident. The defendant rushes in and immediately points the gun. And as you'll see in a little bit, Mr. Rosenbaum doesn't take kindly to people pointing guns. And here is the response from the defense, this is number eight, talking about the issue of provocation. You'll see Mr. Rosenbaum take off when he sees my client coming, along with the Zeminskis, to set up the ambush of my client. Provocation? I don't think so. Now, before I play the sound from the judge here, there are a lot of people out there claiming that if you believe, the jury believes, that Kyle Rittenhouse provoked the incident, well, that means he can't claim self-defense. That's not true under Wisconsin law. It is true that it makes it much, much harder to claim self-defense. But it is not true that it eliminates, and I've been hearing analyst after analyst incorrectly stating that if there is provocation on the part of Kyle Rittenhouse, well, th that means he can't claim self-defense and ju and justice before i go to the judge's instructions today my analysis of the law there is correct right yes it, it, and we're really looking at the reasonableness of his actions but that rittenhouse could have done things and still be able to use self-defense the question that was bringing in this ar-15 whether a reasonable jury is going to think that isn't provoking it but it's not an automatic and the jury instruction was not that it was automatic. It was something the state has to overcome. Right. And so I, I, let me play. This is number one. This is the judge. And this is so important because so many people are asking the question, well, what if he started it? What if he provoked it? He can still claim self-defense? And the answer is yes. It's just harder. This is Judge Schroeder today. You should also consider whether the defendant provoked the attack. A person who engages in unlawful conduct of a type likely to provoke others to attack and who does provoke an attack is not allowed to use or threaten force in self-defense against that attack. However, if the attack which follows causes the person reasonably, reasonably to believe that he is in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm, he may lawfully act in self-defense. Now. It, the reason, Julius Kim, this was so confusing to so many people is because the first line in the Wisconsin statute is pretty definitive, right? It's this idea that, you know, as he just said, well, if you provoke it, you can't use self-defense. But then as he points out, you say, however, comma, there is this exception. And, and how important, Julius, am I, am I overstating this? I mean, maybe I'm being too lawyerly about this. Maybe the jurors are going to get back there and think about this from a much more common sense perspective than I am. And I'm focusing so much on the provocation and what the judge said about this, et cetera. What do you make of it? I think you're right on, though. I think my experience has been that jurors are pretty conscientious in, in reading jury instructions and making sure they get it right. Um, they go back there and, and they have the jury instructions in front of them. And so I think they're going to go back and reread the jury instructions about provocation. And, and you're also right that this entire case is hinging upon provocation at this point in time, at least as it regards, at least as it relates to the Rosenbaum shooting. And Justice Geske is absolutely correct in, ter in, in terms of the fact that what you want to do is determine whether the defendant's actions were reasonable under the circumstances. And one of the things that you look at is the totality of the circumstances. And you also consider whether he had an opportunity to retreat. That's one of the things that, that the court instructed the jurors about today is whether in determining whether his response was reasonable, the force of the response was reasonable is that you have to look as whether the defendant had an opportunity to retreat or not and whether he took advantage of yep. that opportunity. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a break here. We're going to come back. I'm going to play more of the closing arguments. We're going to talk about a critical charge, in my view, that was dismissed by the judge, 
which is being viewed as controversial about this gun charge, except I went actually and read the statute much more carefully than I had before, and I was suddenly thinking, wow, I think the judge got this one right. There's also the lesser included offenses, so the jury could compromise. All these things to throw at uh, the justice and at Julius Kim. Taking a break, coming right back in a moment. It simply cannot be reasonable for someone to be holding an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle with powerful ammunition and be chased by someone who is unarmed, who's smaller than him, who's shorter than him. And the first thing that you do to defend yourself is you plug four rounds into it. But that's not actually what happened. It wasn't the first thing that he did. Continuing with our coverage of the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, closing arguments just ended just over an hour ago. The jury now has uh, the case. We're joined again by former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Janine Geske and by attorney Julius Kim. All right, uh, Justice Geske, let me ask you, I mean, the prosecutor is trying to sort of minimize uh, what was happening there. And the first shooting is the most important one here, the one of Joseph Rosenbaum is a legal matter. It's the single most important issue in this case. Um, you know, the argument that he was unarmed is relevant, but it's not really the end of the inquiry on self-defense, is it? It isn't, but it's very powerful evidence. You know, when you're talking about provocation and whether provocation is enough, if, if I started taunting somebody and they pulled out a gun on me, I could then shoot them. And even though I may have provoked it, I was using reasonable self-defense against a gun. Here, that AR-15, it's really going to be a jury issue if that is enough provocation for him to have that. And then somebody reacts and then he takes the life. So, um, I, I mean, I think... But it's a matter of how the jury looks at this. Yeah, uh, but Julius Kim, I don't really see the provocation here. I mean, I know it's a really important jury charge, right? Um, and yeah, the fact that he's got an AR-15, but a lot of people in Wisconsin have AR-15s. So <laughs> I, I'm not, is that not true? I mean, it, it, you're laughing, uh, Justice Gaskey. Am I wrong not on that? Down, not running down the middle of the street downtown. No, they, I'm sure people have them. But to be, have them and carrying them out in a volatile situation, you don't see a lot of them. In fact, I don't think well, I've ever seen them in the streets. Well, <laughs> carry them in a volatile situation. You, you know, now we've we, now we've added facts, not right. evidence, uh, or uh, to, to the to the circumstance. <laughs> um, but he has the prerogative. She's a former justice. <laughs> I, I understand. I understand. I judge, but, so, <laughs> but 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 Julius Kim. I mean, again, the provocation. What the provocation is that he was there with an AR-15? I mean, what is, the, what is the strongest argument that the prosecution has on, on provocation? I'm, I'm glad to bring this up, Dan, because I think the provocation is not just the fact that Rittenhouse had an AR-15, but that he's alleged to have pointed it specifically at the Zeminskis. And that's where this video, this drone video, and, and the replay of, of this exact snapshot comes into play. So I think the, the, the state's theory is that at some point, Rittenhouse was running around the corner, drops this fire extinguisher, and then takes this AR and points it at another person. That causes Rosenbaum to respond and yelling, gun, 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 and starts chasing after right. Rittenhouse. He's allowed to do that under defense of others, and that is the provocation to the pursuit right. and everything else that follows. But, but that has to presume that Rittenhouse and the other witness who testified about him saying, I'm going to kill him, is not true. Because if that happened, then Rittenhouse does have the right to pull out his weapon um, if he's being threatened in that way. Let me play the defense. This is number nine. This is talking specifically about this question about um, Rosenbaum, the victim, threatening Kyle Rittenhouse. The threat. If I get either of you alone, I will kill you. That is a threat with a statement and a promise. And lo and behold... The chance presented itself to Mr. Mr. Rosenbaum, and he attempted to execute it. Justice Geske, I mean, if you believe he said that, and it wasn't just Kyle Rosenbaum who testified to that, you know, the provocation becomes tough for the prosecution. 
Well, and it's got to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, again, the prosecution has the burden. It is a tough question. You know, I think people are predicting, some people are predicting this is going to be a quick verdict. I don't think so. I think the jury I'm with has you. questions, and there's going to be a division of views on what happened and how you apply the law here. So I think it is a tough case. I, I completely agree that this is going to be not a quick verdict. In particular, um, let me go back to Julius Kim, because of what are called the lesser included offenses here. Now, there is not a lesser included offense on the most important one here, which is the, the Rosenbaum case. And that's the one, the incident with the four shots, et cetera. There are lesser included on the other two shootings, but I have to tell you, Julius Kim, I don't think that the other two are gonna be that close. Meaning, I think the jury is going to be able to say quickly that in the case of Huber and in the case of Gross Croydis, very quickly they're going to say, we got to go with self-defense. Prosecutors have not disproven that beyond a reasonable doubt. And then they don't even get to the lesser included. But what do you make of that? I think you picked up on a great point here, and it's not to get too much in the weeds here, but it's interesting that the Rosenbaum shooting was charged out as a first-degree reckless homicide, not as a first-degree intentional homicide. So the option for a lesser-included offense of second-degree intentional homicide uh, is not available for that particular count. That makes it more difficult. I also agree with you that the Huber and Grosskreutz shootings are going to come back a lot faster. I think that's why the state's concentrating so much in their closing arguments about the Rosenbaum shooting, because I think they recognize that that is the count and the homicide charge that they have the most, uh, the best chance on at this point. But there's no lesser included offenses regarding that particular count. And I think that's going to force these jurors to either go all or nothing. And that could make a difference as to whether they secure a conviction on that count. All right. And most important, I shouldn't say most important, but really important to me is I've been saying, you know, he's going to at least get convicted on the gun charge. And it's a misdemeanor, but it faces up to nine months. I keep saying that. He's going to at least get convicted on the gun charge. He was under the age of 18. He had a dangerous weapon. Seems like a slam dunk. The judge dismissed that charge today. When we come back, I'm going to talk to my guests, but I'm, I've become convinced that the judge was right, which means that I wasn't doing enough legal research before. Coming right back. There are tragical, tragic parts of it, but Kyle Rittenhouse's behavior was protected under the law of the state of Wisconsin, the law of self-defense. These arguments just wrapped up about an hour and a half ago in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The jury now has that case. They will begin deliberations tomorrow morning. Uh, still with us, two terrific guests, uh, former Wisconsin Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Janine Geske, and Julius Kim, uh, attorney there in Wisconsin as well. Um, all right, so one critical issue that happened today is one of the charges was dismissed by the judge, and it was the one that many of us believed was going to be the easiest one for the prosecutors to um, prove. And that is that there was unlawful possession of a dangerous weapon by someone under the age of 18. Here's what the judge said today in dismissing that count. If the barrel length is less than 16 inches, or an overall length less than 26 inches, then I'll deny the motion. If it does not meet those specifications, then this most uh, defense motion will be granted. <coughs> we are not disputing that the barrel that the barrel length is appropriate. Isn't legal? It is not a short barreled shotgun or a short barreled rifle. Yes. Either by barrel or by overall length? Correct. All right. And then count to six is dismissed. All right. Before I go to Justice Geske on how we just learned about this now and why it's just being dismissed now, which I have no idea how that's the case, let me explain what the gobbledygook they were talking about there is. All right. So the law in Wisconsin says possession of a dangerous weapon by a person under 18. In this section, dangerous weapon means any firearm loaded or unloaded. Okay, that's the part that I had looked at before. And I figured, 
oh, this is a slam dunk. Now, there is an exception in the law, in Section 3C, that says this section applies only to a person under 18 years of age who possesses or is armed with a rifle or a shotgun if the person is in violation of Section 941.28. And that section says that it has to be possession of a short-barreled shotgun or short-barreled rifle. And the definition of that means a rifle having one or more barrels, having a length of less than 16 inches, et cetera, et cetera. So Justice Geske explained to me why, I understand maybe why I didn't know this up to this point, right? A. I'm not a Wisconsin lawyer. B, I don't do my homework enough. But I want to know, how is it that everyone else in that courtroom didn't know that until the very end of the case where, the, you know, we're, we're about to give the case to the jury? Well, first of all, I think that probably nobody was really focusing on that because of the more, much more serious charges. That's not a defense. Um, and I think people have read that statute to mean to allow um, young people who are hunting to carry a rifle, um, except when it's a short barrel gun. And I think that's the interpretation that people have given. Of course, we, the defense very creatively and justifiably um, made their argument today, and I understand the judge's ruling. Now, he could have let it go to the jury and use it as an appellate issue, but the judge has been very careful not to give rulings that may give grounds for an appeal later on to the defendant. And I think he decided on this misdemeanor, it looks on the statute on the face, it doesn't apply, I'm going to dismiss the charge. And I think he probably did the right thing. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, Julius Kim, it doesn't seem to me from reading the statute that it's even close. So I don't, I mean, and when I say that, I mean, yeah, you could let it go, sure. But when you read the statute, it specifically says this section only applies when the person, et cetera, is in violation of that particular section. So right. am, I, am I being unfair here in, in asking sort of how did this happen without us knowing about it until now? I think the state was prosecuting this particular account based upon custom and tradition. And Justice Geske is right that the law has been applied a certain way over the years and, and prosecuted a certain way over the years. But we come across a situation like this that's a little novel, and we have defense attorneys who are desperate to try and get rid of a count here, and they bring it up. And they've I, pointed out an issue that needs to be resolved at this but, point by the legislature. But this doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like a technicality to me. I mean, it seems like it's exactly how the statute is written. I mean, the statute is written terribly, by the way. I mean, that's a separate issue, right? Because it does seem contradictory that, that the first line of the statute talks about a dangerous weapon being any firearm loaded or unloaded. And then later in the statute, it but I don't know. So, so, so maybe it's just me who was surprised by this, but I was stunned that suddenly we're evaluating this question now um, and after rereading the statute, I thought, wow, well, the judge has this one right, but we shall see. All right, let me take one more break. I'm going to ask you both to think about your predictions, the stuff that legal analysts like to do least, right? The last right. thing legal analysts want to answer is, number one, how long will the jury deliberate? And number two, what is the jury going to do? It is the most annoying, frustrating questions, and they are the questions I'm going to ask you after the break. Coming up in a moment. You don't bring a gun to a fist fight. <clears throat> what the defendant wants you to believe is that because he's the one who brought the gun, he gets to kill. So I want you to contrast this, two different scenarios. One scenario where there's two guys who are throwing punches at one another like a bar fight. I think we'd all agree you can't kill someone. You can't punch the guy, knock him to the ground, and then get on him and strangle the life out of him. That's murder. So what's the difference here? Well, of course, the difference is that he had a gun, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not, as a legal matter, self-defense. Back with us is the former Wisconsin Supreme Court Justice Janine Geske and Julius Kim, criminal defense lawyer. All right, Justice Geske, I warned you before the break on the kind of question. I'm going to disclose what I think is going to happen. I'm going to give a day. I'm going to give a verdict. Um, how, long a, how long a deliberation do you expect and what do you expect the outcome to be? 
Um, I would predict either late Thursday or Friday sometime for a verdict that would give them two to three days. Um, I, my, I suspect we'll hear from them with questions about jury instructions and maybe even want to see some of the videos. And I believe that there's a good chance that they will convict um, Rittenhouse of the Rosenbaum homicide and lesser included on the other. Interesting. Julius Kim, what do you make? And you know, if Justice Geskin, I knew the answer, this would be on a yacht somewhere, right? Um, <laughs> my, my prediction is that um, he is going to get convicted of the reckless homicide charge. And I know I'm going out on a limb there and acquitted of all the other charges. As far as how long they're going to be out, I think they're going to be out. Um, my prediction is uh, Thursday uh, after lunch. I, by the way, agree with both of you on Thursday. I'd written it down. I wish I had sort of hidden it and then sort of put it in an envelope so you wouldn't think that I was just taking your, your sage advice and then using it as my own. Um, I had down on my piece of paper Thursday, I agree with Justice Geske that you're going to see questions from the jury. You're going to see requests for evidence, et cetera. We're going to get a sense of where the jury is going with this. I am convinced that there are going to be not guilty verdicts on both of the counts where there are lesser included, meaning of Huber and of Gross Croydus. Rosenbaum is closer. I am leaning towards either a hung jury or a not guilty verdict. And if there's a not guilty verdict, that would mean not guilty all the way around. But we will see. We'll get once we get a little more information tomorrow, that will allow our tea leaf reading to be slightly more informed. And I hope that both of you uh, will come back. Um, Julius Kim, as always, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Justice Geske, such a pleasure to have you on the show. We really do look forward to having you back. I enjoyed it. Thank Thanks you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, Steve Bannon indicted. Big news. But some of our friends in the 24-7 cable news game would have you believe it's sending a clear and chilling message that just didn't happen. Up next. Time now for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. The indictment of Steve Bannon was big news on the cable news networks as the former advisor to President Trump refused to comply with the House Select Committee subpoena investigation into January 6th. It was everywhere. But it is nowhere near as monumental as the cable networks would have you believe. It seems all of them have concluded that the indictment, which was not remotely surprising, is going to suddenly send a dire message. A chilling message. Former President Trump ally Steve Bannon indicted for criminal contempt of Congress. Well, it's, this indictment certainly sends a message and is something that uh, will not be lost on any of them. It sends a real message to all the others who have been subpoenaed. They've got to come and tell the truth. A clear message to others refusing to cooperate with the January 6th probe. And this message meme was not just on CNN. The Justice Department is sending a message to Trump allies who wish to defy House subpoenas. This, I think, sends a very strong message that they're not playing around. I think the message is, is significant for Steve Bannon. And it definitely sends a strong message, like we said. You know, this has got to send a tremendous message to everybody else in Trump world who up until now have felt that they were protected, immune, and above the law. As much as the media seems to want you to believe that this changes everything, it doesn't. They're, they're selling the news. Bannon won't be forced to testify, just potentially punished for refusing to do so. And the notion that other Trump advisors are now going to be shaking in their boots. I'm with former Nixon advisor John Dean on this one. I suspect Bannon is quietly celebrating tonight uh, that this new attention has been given to him because he's declared outright that he wants to destroy the administrative state. In other words, he wants to attack democracy and all these kinds of democratic operations. So this plays right into that kind of mentality. Wait, he didn't get the message? Steve Bannon would never use this to like promote himself, right? This grave charge on this momentous day, which sent a chilling message, right? Just want to say, every, tell everybody, get uh, live stream on Getter right now. Everybody watching in the war room, we're here today. I don't want anybody to take their eye off the ball of what we do every day. Yes, Steve Bannon promoted his live stream 
while turning himself into the authorities. The only message that's being sent to Bannon, an opportunity. Look, the indictment makes perfect sense. He has no legitimate argument to refuse to testify. But the cable news overreaction and misinterpretation of its impact is just so, well, typical cable news. That's our wrap-up of the day's media bias, buzz, and the bull. Coming up. Police officers open fire on an SUV after the driver hits both officers. A lieutenant from that department takes us through the insane body cam footage coming up next. Time for our police cam segment showing the dangers that police officers face every day. Police in Riverside, California were patrolling after hours near a shopping center when a security guard flagged them down, saying he was concerned about two men in a parked Honda Pilot. Two officers investigated, saw a drug pipe in the car, and asked both men to step out of the vehicle. I'll show you what happened next from each of the officers' body cams. There's a few seconds of silence before the camera starts recording sound. Hey, get on the ground! Yes, get on the ground now! Sorry, y'all. Get on the ground now! Right. What the f are you doing? Twenty-five shots fired at uh, Enterprise on University. The driver, Jason White, was on probation for a drug conviction. He put the SUV in reverse, lurching it back and hitting both officers with the open doors. The officer on the driver's side was slammed into the cruiser so hard it damaged the police vehicle. His badge was ripped from his shirt. Both officers ended up opening fire, hitting White as he shifted into drive and slammed into the back of another parked vehicle. The passenger surrendered, was detained. He was not charged. Now, police were able eventually to get White out of the vehicle, take him to the hospital. He's facing multiple charges, including assault with a deadly weapon against an officer evading police and hit and run. The officer who was smashed into his cruiser was hospitalized and has recovered. The other officer was treated at the scene. Police recovered two guns, several extra clips, and boxes of bullets from the suspect's vehicle. Joined by Riverside Police Lieutenant Chad Milby, who oversees investigations on all use of force incidents in the department, He's also a police academy instructor who teaches tactics and active shooter response. Lieutenant, thank you very much for coming on the program. Appreciate it. So this happens around midnight at a closed shopping center. What do the officers know when this incident starts? Well, Dan, they know that uh, they were flagged down. Uh, they know it's an occupied vehicle. They know it's late at night. Uh, just like you alluded to, it was just prior to midnight. Um, they know based on their training experience of working in this particular area that there is a lot of violent crime. Uh, we've seen more guns taken off the street last year and this year than I've ever seen throughout my entire career. So going into that, they know there's a high likelihood that there is potentially some type of criminal activity going on inside this vehicle. Uh, whenever we approach an occupied vehicle, uh, whether it be a traffic stop or just a vehicle that stopped in, in this case, it's one of the most dangerous situations that an officer can walk into. There's a lot of unknown. Well, and also we should, again, remind people that they were flagged down here, right? This is not a situation where they just walked up. They were flagged down by a security guard who was concerned, and they then investigated. Police try to get the guys to step out of the vehicle when the suspect then puts it into reverse, slams it on the gas. Let's look at that one more time again. It starts in silence. Hey, get on the ground. Get on the ground now. Sorry, y'all. Get on the ground now. Now, you're involved in training a lot. I don't, I don't imagine this is the sort of scenario you can actually train an officer for because there's going to be a lot of just reaction and having to just um, you know, use what you know, 
where you know the lines are, but you can't specifically train for something like this, can you? Well, Dan, we train our officers to have good situation awareness. They have to pay attention not only to what's going on inside the vehicle, but everything that's going on outside the vehicle. In this case, you'll see just prior to the shooting taking place, the driver actually leans forward and he looks in the direction of the passenger officer on the passenger side of the vehicle. So we, there's things mm -hmm. that we, we teach our officers are called pre-force pre indicators. Pre-force indicators are things or mannerisms, they're actions of suspects that are generally uh, precede a use of force. And in this case, uh, I haven't spoken to the officer, but I would imagine that that is something that he picked up on. It was very intentional. He leaned forward, looked at that passenger side officer uh, as if he was beginning to formulate a plan. There's something that's called yeah. the reactionary gap. The reactionary gap is that, that amount of time to react to a suspect's actions. And the reactionary gap is always gonna take longer for us to react than it is for the suspect to decide to act. Well, I, I wanna ask you about this. So after crashing, the suspect stays in the car, he ignores orders from police, he appears to be reaching for something as we've discussed. They, you know, I, I think there was a level of restraint, was there not, in the officer not shooting again? Absolutely. Uh, we have to continually assess. Um, we take what we call a tactical pause. We, we bring things back down, we stabilize, and if the suspect no longer poses uh, an imminent threat of great bodily injury or death, then we, can, we have to stop. We make that assessment. And now we have to formulate a plan under very controlled conditions to figure out what is the safest manner in getting the passenger into custody and then ultimately getting the suspect into custody in this case so we can begin to render life-saving uh, me methods to, to the suspect. Well, Lieutenant Milby, please uh, send our um, thoughts uh, to both of the officers involved, particularly the one who was hospitalized. We were so relieved to hear that he is okay. Um, uh, we're thinking about him, and we really appreciate the time uh, you took to come on the program. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. That does it for us tonight. We will be continuing our verdict watch in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Again, the jury begins deliberations tomorrow. I'll bet there'll be something from that jury that we'll be able to talk about on tomorrow night's show. News Nation Prime starts right now. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.